My name is Rajkumar Roy. I'm a professor of competitive design at Cranfield University in the UK. And we have just completed first industrial product service system conference, CIRP conference at Cranfield. We have just completed the first day. And it's really we are really fortunate that uh, Andy Harrison from Rolls-Royce is here. He is the chief life cycle engineer at Rolls-Royce. And I'll be asking him questions. Andy, first is about the whole idea of power by the hour. Whenever we hear, hear about power by the hour, it's about Rolls-Royce. Yeah. We also hear total care package from Rolls-Royce. Would you like to tell us how did it evolve within the company? Rolls-Royce is... Um started off its roots in the traditional manufacturing type role so we've uh, had a long history of producing um, fairly complex mechanical components and systems. Um, probably 30 plus years ago we started to evolve away from producing and selling original equipment and spare components um, into taking on some of the, uh, the maintenance support activities. Um, so that originally started with uh, picking up some of our own overhaul facilities, becoming more involved in that kind of activity. Um, and from that, we've kind of expanded into to more and more service offer, um, offerings. Um, the concept of a total care package is that uh, instead of simply offering the ability for a, a user to overhaul his uh, engine in our facilities, we now sell a, a maintenance contract, um, most often at the point of sale of the original product. Um, you know, that started off in the world of maybe selling a, a four or five year contract to provide maintenance services. And that's kind of expanded now to the point where on some of the contracts, you know, we're selling an engine which has a life expectancy of 25, 30 years. And at the point where we sell it, we're also selling a fixed price maintenance contract for that, that time period. So we're essentially taking on the, the risk of the maintenance costs on behalf of the operator um, and in return they pay us a, um, a certain number of dollars for every flying hour that they operate. So it gives them the stability of knowing you know, that they have a true understanding of what their costs of maintenance are right up front. So um, it takes the risk out of their hands. What's the difference between power by the hour and total care? Power by the hour is, is really the concept of, of the payment terms. So the, the idea that in, instead of um, operating an engine for a period of time and then when the overhaul event takes place you receive a bill for it um, and you pay the size of, of that invoice depending upon what was done. To, to contracting where literally at the end of every month or every three months or every six months, there's an agreement that for every hour that the, the product has been flown, um, then there's a certain payment uh, fee for that. So power by the hour is that, that change to a, an hourly payment type, type approach, which is a, a spread cost. Um, at some points we've talked about power by the hour including the cost of, of the original equipment. So almost a leasing type program where the, um, the operator um, never actually buys the assets, they, they effectively lease the asset for, a, for an hourly rate. Now that's very, it's actually very rare to do that. We, we do typically sell the product, um, sometimes to a leasing company who in turn will lease it onto the end, end user. Total care comes with a variety of other value added services potentially. So um, one of the, uh, the most common ones is something uh, called engine health monitoring um, where part of the service we op offer is that we will monitor the way the engine behaves in service um, and we'll, we'll provide an alerting service to, uh, to the operator so that when we detect something in the, the way the engine's performing that tells us that it's approaching the point where it's going to need some uh, maintenance activity we can provide them with plenty of upfront warning. So the idea is, if you've got an operator who um, flies an aircraft that may only return to its home base once every six, seven, eight days, 
if you can provide them with several weeks of notice that maintenance is required, they've got the opportunity to, to schedule it in. So it's that kind of value-added service where you're really recognising that, that what the customer values is, is the ability to power an aircraft from one place to another. Um, and uncertainty and disruption in that is very, very costly to them. So effectively, we're selling them a service that insulates them from that risk. Would you like to tell us a few key challenges your business is facing in industrial product service systems? Uh, one of the key ones that I have a, a particular interest in is um, the transition from, uh, we've already done the transition from being a, a product designer to a product designer who, who then applies a service um, to, on top of the product. I think the key challenge for me is the one of making the shift that says actually fundamentally we're a service provider and what we have to do is design a product which supports that service offering. Um, and that's quite a cultural challenge because it means you've got to drive an understanding of, of service uh, issues and behaviours right the way through the organisation to the point where the, the teams who are researching technologies that we might not apply for another 10 or 15 years are thinking 15 years beyond that to the point where the, the maintenance costs and the operating costs of the product are kicking in. So that's quite a challenge to get somebody to think about a cost that might or might not occur in 30 years time, but they've got to worry about it now at the same time as they're, they're worrying about the costs that they're about to incur doing the, the piece of research, for instance. So it's quite a cultural challenge to, to get people to, to worry about those sorts of things. Thank you. Now, this cultural challenge and also technological challenge that comes with it in terms of going through this transition to service, wh what are the future trends you observe in the sector as a whole? I, th I think there are two key ones for me. The first is the time frame. I think as, as more and more customers um, experience the the service offering they become far more confident in its provision and what we're seeing is a trend from relatively short-term um, service contracts out to the to the life of the product um, you know to the point where you literally are offering a, a fixed price contract for for maintenance not just to the the first tier um, uh, buyer of the of the product but you're offering a transferable service so that when they sell it on to somebody else um, at some point downstream, and it, it's a, a second customer, we don't actually know who it's going to be, we're still offering a fixed price contract for that's transferable to that group. So the time frame that we have to be able to predict costs for and be uh, considerate of the risks involved is, is growing immensely. Um, so that, that's one of the key challenges, is that managing the additional uncertainty of, of the extra time frame. Uh, I think the other key thing is the transition from reactive services to proactive services. Um, it's one thing to provide a maintenance service where when a customer demands it, you have a, a available shop space, you have available supplies to, to uh, undertake a repair activity for them. Um, it's quite another to, to be in a position of predicting when that's going to be required um, and having the confidence to intervene in their operation um, early enough to, to avoid any, um, any disruption and complexity. Um, and it's a bit like uh, somebody from the, the garage ringing you up and saying, I think you ought to bring your car in to, tomorrow to be serviced because we've just detected an anomaly and we think you might have a flat tire a week on Thursday. It's, you know, it's how do you get to that point where you have the confidence to make that phone call and the customer has the confidence to believe that your prediction is actually right and it's worth coming in for the, the service early. Thank you for that. Now this is very close to what we are trying to do within CIRP as well. Within CIRP we are trying to develop a multidisciplinary community to research transition to a service-based industry. And that's what we are talking about within industrial product service systems. Thank you very much.